Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Meinong. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome to Real to Real. And happy Father's Day out there. What about Monsignor's Day, Pat? There's no Monsignor's <laughs> Father's Day. No, really, truly, happy Father's Day. They deserve everything we, you and I can give them, all of us. You know, fathers are very special people. And I sometimes wonder about being a father of a priest must be a tough thing. Yes, but it must be a very proud thing to be the father of a priest. Yes, but then the people in the neighborhood expect him to be somebody extra special like Plaster Paris Statue Saint, <laughs> and he's not that. They're very normal, warm human beings. Your dad was? Yes, very warm. Not yeah. strict and tough? And oh, he's strict and tough. Oh, but yeah. my, one of my sisters once said he was tougher than I ever knew because I was the youngest of the family, so I never knew how tough he could Spoiled. have been. Spoiled rotten, <laughs> no doubt about it. My father helped to do it, but he did one thing. He shaped me up very quickly. He said to me, I said I wanted to go to the seminary. He said, do you think it can be save your soul at that? And I thought I was a shoe in for sanctity if I went that far. <laughs> well, fathers try to make us over and they do a good job of it. Making things over is not easy. Remember George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, Making Over Somebody, came out as My Fair Lady? Joe O'Neill has a special story on that for us tonight. And my special guest represents an organization that can do a wonderful thing for children. What if, God forbid, your child had a life-threatening condition? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could grant them their fondest dream? Stay tuned. I know that fondest dreams were far away, I think, from St. John Newman's life. But his sanctity is such, we began to show you last week about the shrine renewal. Uh, this week, I want to show you some more about what happened at the shrine and its renewal. Because when you discover St. John Newman, you find out that the great sanctity of a man never can get in the road of the humble remains of the saint. This is the story of a simple man, a humble and devout man, a man who sought no position of power, desired no special privileges, and expected no particular attention. This was a man whose only wish in life was to serve the God he loved so deeply. This was a man whose name was John Newman. John Nepomucene Newman's greatest desire in life was to be a simple priest, but instead he was selected to be the fourth bishop of Philadelphia position which he never would have chosen for himself. Although bishop of the largest diocese in the country, John Newman continued to live the life of an ordinary priest, avoiding all displays of his rank whenever possible. Ever mindful of his vow never to waste a minute, Bishop Newman often neglected his own needs in the service of God, and it was in doing his master's will that Bishop Newman collapsed on the street, dying in the home of a stranger alone. The Church of St. Peter the Apostle in Philadelphia, PA, is the final resting place of Bishop Newman. Once entombed in the burial crypt below the church, St. John Newman now rests in a glass sarcophagus beneath the marble altar of the newly restored Newman Shrine. The National Shrine of America's first male saint was renovated recently in order to bring it up to date, both physically and liturgically. In addition to the other renovations accomplished at the shrine, the mortal remains of the saint were also refurbished. Originally entombed in the floor of the church, the body was exhumed and placed within the back altar just prior to the ceremonies declaring John Newman blessed in 1963. In the 27 years since the beatification, many changes have taken place, the most important being the inclusion of John Newman's name among the Legion of Saints. Last year, as a part of the restoration, the remains of St. John Newman were removed from the altar and reconstructed. This process, which took three days to complete, involved two separate aspects, the refurbishing of the effigy mask and the revesting of the mortal remains. Ronald Pacelli, a funeral director from the Philadelphia area, was commissioned by the Archdiocese to undertake this enormous project. Once removed from the glass altar, the remains of Bishop Newman were taken and placed on a portable dressing table. Under the careful direction of four experts from the Dodge Chemical Company of Massachusetts, the effigy mask was removed from over the skull. This mask, constructed from one quarter inch plaster cast some 27 years prior, 
was found to be in excellent condition, although slightly faded from age. Pictures and sketches of Bishop Newman were then examined to help determine his correct likeness and skin tones. After carefully testing the surface of the mask with various cosmetic mediums, restorative artists Dick Sanders and his son Charles agreed that the Dodge Perma Cosmetics were best suited for this purpose. These cosmetics were chosen because of their ability to conceal the slight flaws in the surface and maintain a permanent smudge-free finish. When the application of the opaque finish was completed, the hair restorations were applied. This process is done by spreading a thin layer of special wax over the penciled pattern in the area to which the hair is to be attached. One inch sections of human hair are then cut and embedded in the wax base to restore the sideburns. When the predetermined area is covered, the hair is then trimmed, thinned, and combed until it gives a natural appearance. The eyebrows were restored in a similar fashion with the substitution of individual strands of hair for the one inch sections. The construction of the eyelashes was accomplished by attaching one inch strands of hair in double thickness to a foundation of adhesive tape, simulating the natural growth pattern. The hair was thinned to the correct length and inserted into the line of closure in the wax. Natural eyelid wrinkles and lines were duplicated on the surface and smoothed into their natural shape. Utilizing the only photo ever taken of Bishop Newman, the artist determined that the mask lacked the natural facial expression and contour of the mouth present in Newman's face. The fullness of the lips was duplicated by using modeling wax, which was selected because of its stability and firmness. Characteristic lines were eventually added in the wax to simulate the lip lines and establish a more natural appearance. As the work on the mask progressed, the examination and revesting of the body began. The old faded bishop's robes were carefully removed and the mortal remains of John Newman exposed. After careful inspection, it was found that the remains contained in a transparent burial pouch were in excellent condition despite the fact that they were never subjected to any embalming process. The skeleton, not in need of any additional preservation, was then redressed in the purple bishop's cassock, white alb, red cincture, and white chasuble. These vestments, custom made by the C.M. Almy Company of Connecticut, were fashioned from fine linen, which was lined in gold satin and edged with a religious pictorial pattern. A new pectoral cross and Episcopal ring were also added before St. John Newman was laid to rest on a green velvet mattress and a newly renovated glass casket. The bishop's miter, which was composed of the same material as the vestments, was applied after the refurbished effigy mask was in place. Once this was completed, the casket was officially sealed by the vicar and placed within the marble and glass altar in the center of the sanctuary, easily accessible to the 30,000 pilgrims who visit the shrine each year. With the renovations of the shrine now complete, it is certain that the number of visits to this holy place will undoubtedly increase, along with the amount of devotion to St. John Newman, an idea to which John Newman would probably object, simply because he was such a humble man. I just never get enough of St. John Newman. I hope it's true of you, too. And if you have not been to the shrine, as I said last week, please go, plan to go. Just don't wait for the occasion. But go see St. John Newman's Shrine and pray for all of us. We're going to have some more interesting things for you just in a few minutes. Stay with us, won't you? Could this Philadelphian be made a saint of the Catholic Church? The answer may be yes. She's Catherine Drexel, beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1988. Now you can experience her adventurous life story on audio cassette. Get America's Catherine Drexel, The Life of a Saintly Woman. Hear about her life through the voices of the people who actually knew her and continue her work today. The cost of this dramatic audio cassette is only $4.95. To order, call 215-587-3775. That's 215-587-3775. Hey, Max, watch it. Sarah's mom might hear us. So how old did you say this stuff was? It belonged to my great-grandparents. It's almost 100 years old. Pretty neat. What could have made these people so angry? Homeless. Gosh, 
think some people really didn't have homes. Hey. Look at this one. Oh, that's the bomb. That was something real bad, wasn't it? Sarah, could this thing kill us? Oh, no. All of the people got together last century and got rid of all of the bombs, and there aren't any left. <laughs> Let's give the future back to the children. a millionaire when I grow up. No one ever says, I want to be a junkie when I grow up. Don't let drugs get in the way of your dreams. If your child had a life-threatening condition, I would imagine it would be a great source of comfort if you could make their most precious dream come true. Well, there are agencies and people available in the Delaware Valley who can assist you if this should be your situation. Our guest today is Krista Friedrich, Executive Director of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Welcome, Krista. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Now, I understand this organization has been around for 10 years. You've been in the Delaware Valley since 1986? 1986, that's correct. And you're in the business of making dreams come true. Yes. Okay. First of all, tell us about the children. Who are these children and how do you learn about them? Well, our primary sources for children are Children's Hospital, St. Christopher's, and the Ronald McDonald House. Mm -hmm. And we have social workers at the hospitals and people who work at the Ronald McDonald House who will call us and say they have a child and will tell us the child's condition and that the child does have a wish. Okay, and uh, what ages are we talking about? We grant wishes for children two and a half to 18. Two and a half to 18. I'll bet you that I can guess the wish most often requested. Okay. Disney, Disney yes. World? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Trips to Disney absolutely World. correct. So it's most of the children. To them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what um, what has been the most unusual request that you've had? Unusual, uh, I guess, would be only in the respect of what it took to bring the child's wish to fruition. And that was last Christmas. We had a child at the Ronald McDonald House here from Poland for a liver cancer treatment at one of the hospitals. And he asked that we bring his brother from Poland. And we had to get congressmen involved and Governor Casey's office and the consulates. But we were able to pull it off. And they went to New York and they picked up his brother. And he was very, very happy to see him. You do it. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, now, Krista, how, how do you fund the program? Who pays for all the things that you grant the children? Contributions. From individuals, we are always looking for corporate sponsorship. We are going to be applying for grants from some of the local foundations. Mm -hmm. But primarily, our funds come from individuals. Primarily from individuals. And I suppose you can always use more contributions. Yes. OK. Yes. Now, um, in, your, in your years with the foundation, what uh, was, would be the most gratifying wish to you that you've granted? To me personally, I would have to probably take most of your show to tell you which ones are most gratifying, but uh, I had several last year, a little girl who just wanted a dog, and another little girl who wanted a parrot because she wanted to teach a parrot how to talk. And I would have to say that emotionally, uh, it, it's very gratifying. Very, it must be. Now, it takes a lot of people, I suppose, to bring these wishes together and uh, are you heavily staffed? Do you use volunteers? How, who, who does this? Who brings these wishes about? Well, currently I am the only staff member. Everyone else is a volunteer? Everyone else is a volunteer. And until I came on board full time with the organization in March, I was also a volunteer for two and a half years. So we are now 99% volunteer. All right. I suppose you can always use more volunteers. Always, too. always. We have seven different committees that people yeah, can serve on. What are some of the on. things volunteers would do? Well, we have the Wish Interview Committee, and this is comprised of the people who would actually go to the Children's Hospital or to the Ronald McDonald House or to the child's home to talk to them to be sure that the wish that we're granting is the child's wish. 
and you mean an the parents wish? Sometimes. Sometimes oh, it can be. They could be coaxed and cajoled a little bit, but generally we want to find out what the child wants most in the world. Okay. So the child might want something really very simple yes. and the parent wants to give yes. them something grand. Right. We've had it happen. We've I had it happen. See. So the wish committee, what else? Would then we have wish do? granting. As soon as the interview with the family and the child is done, the paperwork is turned over to the wish granting committee and they take the wish and they run with it. And they are the ones responsible for putting the wish together, mm -hmm. whether it is a trip to Disney or getting a dog or taking the child to a pet shop to pick up a parrot. Mm -hmm. And you really, you take care of everything. If it is a trip, say, to Disney World, the plane fare, everything, the hotels, everything. everything. We pick the family up in a limo. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the children we have are in wheelchairs. So sometimes we have to provide special vans to pick them up. But the family is transported to and from the airport. We provide the airfare, the hotels, everything. Their meals, money for souvenirs, whatever the family needs. Now, Krista, when the family um, has received the wish, tell us a bit about how it affects the parents and the rest of the family. I know the child must be elated, but how, what does the effect on the Well, I can parents? tell you from personal experience, we have received so many thank you cards and letters from parents, and they are very emotional when they finally sit down to write a thank you for us. In some cases, the child has already passed away even as soon as two weeks after the wish is granted. We got one letter from a family last year that was, that was very emotional for all of us to read because she said that we know now that he is happy in what he's doing and we made his last wish come true. And as soon as she got over her grief, she would like very much to help out the Make-A-Wish Foundation. To work with you. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Must be wonderful. I know it is gratifying work. You have a wonderful job. May you continue. And the Make-A-Wish Foundation can continue its wonderful work with your assistance, whether it's with your person as a volunteer or with your cash contribution. Please get in touch with the Wish Foundation. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Pat. Do you like film? Yes. Well, we have uh, Joe O'Neill, pick of the week. Uh, Joe's vintage VCR pick this week is a real classic, My Fair Lady. Strolling through the video store aisles, you get a buffet of popular movie culture. Browsing, you see a little Satanism. Skip around, and you glue your eyes on a teen sex romp. Here and there, you discover a good drama or a comedy. But wait, over there, on the lower shelves, you come across a Hollywood artifact called a musical. You spot one, My Fair Lady, starring Audrey Hepburn and Rex Harrison. Best picture of the year, 1964. You pause. Do you really want to sit through an old-fashioned musical with all these other teasing and eye-grabbing videos around you? You bet you do. The Learner and Low musical, My Fair Lady, is fantastic family entertainment. Give your children the treat of hearing such standard songs as On the Street Where You Live, Wouldn't It Be Loverly, and The Rain in Spain. To refresh you, My Fair Lady tells the story of a British flower girl who is transformed into a society lady. Her mentor, Henry Higgins, trains her in speech and manners. In this scene from My Fair Lady, the poor flower girl, Eliza Doolittle, gets a taste of the transformation she will undertake. First step, take a bath. Oh, couldn't leave me here, missus. It's too good for the likes of me. Oh, I, I shouldn't be afraid to touch anything. I ain't a duchess yet, you know. This, this is where you wash clothes. This is where we wash ourselves, Eliza, and where I'm going to wash you. You expect me to get into that and wet myself all over? Not me. I shall catch me death. Come along now. Come along. Take your clothes off. Come on, girl, do as you're told. Take your clothes off. Here, come on, help me take this back. Oh! No, I won't! Come out of there. Oh, wow, they're right! Right! Come out of there! Take your hands off me! Oh, I won't! No, 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 no,
My Fair Lady will teach the family that although you can change your outside appearance, the best changes happen when you work to improve your inside. The United States Catholic Conference gives My Fair Lady an okay for all audiences. This is Vintage VCR. I'm Joe O'Neill. I'm so glad to have seen that. I had forgotten how entertaining that film was. Well, I'll never forget it, and I'm sure you won't either. Try it again sometime. But meanwhile, we'll be right back. Wait for us. As we prepare to receive Christ into our lives, we are to judge not the appearance of ourselves, but the hearts of ourselves. First, we'll take a ride in the car, all right? my day. Go ahead, make someone's day with love. We welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, 19103. Or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842. Pat, that warm personality of Father Bob Curtis comes up at this time almost every week for us, but it's such a beautiful thing to have see him focus in. Now, he tells us about the focus of love is in the name you give God, but you know, God by any other name is still the same. As a young priest, whenever I was feeling spiritually arid for years, I used to go to the first grade classroom of our parish school because Little children don't have the problem relating to God that adults sometimes do, often do. So I went to see the little kids all the time. One day I was discussing with uh, first graders what things we knew about God and how you talk to him. You know, I want to talk to them about prayer. And the little boy said, well, first you have to know his name and then call him that. And I said, well, I do. When I, when I pray, I always start out, dear God. Well, the little boy seemed appalled. He said, well, that's not very polite. You should call him by name. God is what he is. That's not his name. So I said, well, what's his name? And the little boy said, exasperated with me, Howard. I said, what? He said, Howard. Howard is God's name. And I asked him, the little boy, how he knew that. He said, again, totally exasperated with me, because when you pray, you say, Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. You see, little children think of God as a big human being. And that's perfectly understandable because it's probably impossible to love God without having some image in your mind because God's invisible. And the way human beings are constructed, not just children, but all of us, we need to use our senses to relate to our environment and everyone in the environment. That's what our senses are for. They help us relate to things. We cannot relate to air. That's why God sent his son. And that's why Jesus sent the apostles. That's why the apostles ordained priests. We need focal points for our love. We can't just love the air. And that's why God did not isolate us. He put us here with lots of other people. And in a way, those people stand between us and God. By loving them, we love God. 
St. John wrote, one who has no love for the brothers he has seen cannot love the God he has not seen. We're supposed to love those with whom we share the world. We do not reject, we love. We do not ignore, we love. We do not condemn, we love. We do not envy, we love. We do not hate, we love. That's what we're supposed to be about. And that's how we become begotten of God. St. John put it this way. He said, everyone begotten of God has conquered the world, and the power that conquers the world is this faith of ours. People who do not love are at the mercy of the world. But people who do love give form to their faith, and that faith gives them power. By loving other people, we express our love for God, and we gain the power to beat the world at whatever game it wants to play. The person who hates is imprisoned, while the person who loves is liberated, and freedom is power. Isn't that right, Howard? It's that power, generated by faith, sustained by love, which keeps Christ present in the world. When we go to him at Mass, we do not go alone. We go alongside our brothers and sisters and meld into the people of God, thereby magnifying the power of love on the earth. So come along with me to the altar. I guess the goodness of God, Pat, is best expressed in our title to be, have our prayers heard. It must, if we can say such a thing, must give God our Father such joy to hear, help us. Yes, and you know what, Monsignor? You're probably a father figure to hundreds of people who look at you as warmly as their own father. Because I'm old? <laughs> no, no, no. just a dear. We know the, the joys of father, the, the, the troubles they have. We always, of course, appreciate the real pain that caused to mothers when their children are ill. But fathers suffer great pains when their children are ill, and they mm -hmm. must have great desires for their children. Mm -hmm. That's why I enjoyed so much Christmas coming to us today yes. and talking about the joys of the wishes. Make a wish. I, I know they ran that phone number, but I remember this one. It's 546-WISH if you need it. Fathers, indeed, have many, many good wishes for all of us, and we wish all of you fathers many, many blessings and happiness as to see your children grow well and successfully. And so, with all that, we want to say goodbye and God bless you. Happy Father's Day, fathers, and don't forget, they need you so very badly. Good night. Travel arrangements for Real to Real by Atkinson and Mullen, Newtown Square, PA, 215-359-5980. We use these 30 seconds to talk to you about our young adult prayer group. That is because we would like every young adult, single or married, 18 to 35, to come and experience the power of God. We meet this coming Saturday and every fourth Saturday of the month at Waldron Mercy Academy. If you're totally new, we have talks for you to understand the renewal. Don't worry about not feeling at home. Very quickly, you'll become part of the group. So come on out this Saturday at 7 p.m. to Waldron Mercy Academy. When you come, say you saw us on Real to Real.